Hello, this is Bill Worrell with Virginia Cooperative Extension. Today's episode of 15 Minutes in the Forest, we will go into the woods and look at the American Chestnut. I'm going to take you over to the American Chestnut Foundation's research farm in Glade Spring, Virginia to get an update on the American Chestnut research that they've been doing. Um, I'm Eric Jenkins. I'm the tree breeding coordinator here at the Meadowview Research Farms. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do and the uh, progress we've made so far. We're in one of our um, oldest orchards here on the farm. It's about 25, 26 years old. And in this section that I'm standing in are pure Chinese trees and also some early hybrids. Um, I think it's, it's important to remember that even a Chinese tree is not completely immune to blight. You still see the symptoms of it. On, especially on older Chinese trees or those planted in mediocre soils. Um, and of course, what we're trying to do is incorporate those as much as possible, the blight resistance of the Chinese tree into the American chestnut tree, while retaining as many of the characteristics of the American tree that we can. Chinese trees are small, uh, they are relatively small. They, they grow, they branch out a lot. Um, near the base of the tree rather than growing straight and tall like an American. Um, so they're not a, a Chinese tree is not a very good timber tree. Um, and they're, you know, the ecological features are different. Chinese trees don't do so well um, in a forest setting, a more of an orchard type tree. So um, this tree here is an example of a tree. It's uh, partly American and it has some resistance to the blight, but you still see the splitting of the bark, which is uh, pretty obvious on any tree that's in, uh, infected with blight. Um, you see like the, the bark is swollen. Um, on other trees, you'll see like um, an orange discoloration. Uh, you don't see it so much on this one because it does have a, a modest level of resistance. Up behind me are again, some more of the early crosses. Um, just basically a, a tree cross Chinese and American cross. Um, they have varying levels of blight resistance, but uh, in all cases, they're only a, a modest level. Um, and, and that's uh, basically what you get. So just crossing an American with the Chinese and planting out in the forest is not enough to accomplish our goal of reforesting populations. What I'd like to do now uh, is look at some pure American trees um, and show some of the effects of the blight on, on, on those trees. So this is like a pure American chestnut, not a, not a hybrid or anything like that. And you can see it looks kind of like it's like a bush. It, uh, it's grown up, you know, started from the original stem, died back, re-sprouted. More and more stems come up and then it may die back again and re-sprout. And there are trees that have done that for a hundred years since the blight was first introduced to North America. Um, so this isn't... Uh, an example of what chestnut blight would look like on a tree. Um, and you, you can tell by the, the color of it, um, the bark is, is sort of sunken in. And the way that it kills the tree is by destroying the vascular tissue and girdling the tree. So that's what happened here. This stem is basically dead from that point up. And you can see below there, it sprouted off another branch. So the, the tree is not dead. But usually by the time it gets this size or maybe a little bigger, it's become infected with the blight. So it doesn't get a chance to, to live to maturity and reproduce. And that's what you'll see in, in a forest setting or anywhere. There's millions of chestnut stems in the forest, but they very rarely attain maturity and they very rarely produce any seeds. So our goal is to get them to a level of resistance that they can, they can survive and reproduce in the forest and you know, regain their former prominence. All right, here we have um, another pure American chestnut. So, so this one has managed to survive long enough to produce and, and grow to maturity and it's produced some flowers. We wanted to use it in our breeding program. We wanted to use some of the, the transgenic pollen that we received to permit to use that need a permit and uh, what you do when you want to pollinate a chestnut is first you wait till the flowers just start to emerge and you cover them 
in a bag to protect them from being pollinated by just pollen in the environment. Um, when you do want to do your pollination, you come back to that tree when the flowers are mature. It takes about 12, 14, 15 days so the flowers are ready to be pollinated. They call them receptors. And then you would take the bag off as quickly as you can, apply the pollen to the, to the flower. You have the pollen on like a glass slide or something, a thin layer of pollen. Touch it to the flower. Um, put the bag back on. After that, Sometime after that, you also place a, a, a wire screen. It's basically just a screen like using a screen door or something like that. And we we uh, make them cover the cover the bag itself to keep uh, any squirrels or any other wildlife from getting into the bag. The bags are pretty sturdy, but you want an additional layer of protection so you know that uh, nothing else will get will get to the nuts before you come back in the fall and harvest them. So and then and then when we harvest these, assuming we're, uh, we're successfully pollinated, um, we'll take those. We will we have a test we can do. Um, take a, a small part of the nut and see if it has inherited the the, the gene that was inserted into the the, uh, the father tree. If it does we can grow we can grow those seedlings and they will contain um, that gene and be protected from chestnut blight. Part of, as part of our program, we have a, something called the Large Surviving American, where people have found American chestnut trees that are that seem to exhibit some blight resistance um, that's native to the population, and not, not from a hybrid, not from a Chinese or any other chestnut species. And um, in the course of probably since 1970, there have been about 30 of these trees found, the pure American. Number two, it has to be at least uh, uh, over a foot in diameter. And it has to have been infected with chestnut blight and survived that infection for at least 10 years. Um, so as I said, only 30 trees have been found. Some of them have actually died since they were originally found. But this tree beside me is a pure American that is the offspring of, of, of uh, one of those large surviving Americans, and this particular tree seems to have inherited some of the blight resistance of, of its parent tree. Um, it has the blight, but it shows the discolored bark and the, the bulges in the bark, the, the flaking off of the bark. And it's kind of obvious that this is not a uh, com completely healthy tree, but for an American chestnut, it is quite large. Usually you only find the trees are maybe three or four inches in diameter before the, the blight girdles them and they die back. Whereas this one has survived for uh, 15 or 20 years, I think, um, with the blight. But the blight has not destroyed the vascular tissue, so the tree is still surviving and does produce some nuts each year. To test our trees, we do field test, but we also do something called a small stem assay. As we just grow the trees in the greenhouse, give them three or four months to grow, and then we deliberately infect them with the blight. And you can see on here we made a small scar on the tree. We uh, actually wrap it in uh, parafilm. We have a little plug of blight that we place on the parafilm before we wrap it. And um, that's kind of what this one it ha has been infected and it's starting to develop a canker. See on the adjacent one, it's already developed the orange color and started to damage the tree. Um, there are others in here. You see that one's just got a, a very small canker. It looks like it's starting to develop. Um, this one, oh, here, here's a good one. It's got the, um, well, this would actually not be a good one because you can see the infections started to spread but it uh, looks like it has some of the small orange uh, dots, the fruiting bodies of the fungus. Um, so we'll come back in uh, a few more weeks and then we'll measure how far the canker has spread up and down the stem. And that gives us data. They'll, they'll, they'll vary between just slightly, whereas you know they may spread all the way up from here to here. Um, so we'll, we'll, we have, of course we have a Little number. This this one here happens to be a pure Chinese tree as a control, but most of the others are hybrids, and so we can like estimate 
the blight resistance of the seedlings that come off that tree by how well they do in this small stem cast. The difference between a Chinese leaf, this is a leaf from a pure Chinese that has very small teeth, it's uh, sort of shiny on top, and it's white, has a very thin layer of white hairs underneath. Um, if you look at this under a microscope, it just looks like a dense mat of white hair. Um, as opposed to an American chestnut leaf, which is very long, it's called lanceolate. It's a, the head of it's like a lance. Um, the teeth are more prominent along the edge, very thin and narrow. The base is more of a V-shaped, whereas in the Chinese tree it's sort of a rounded. Um, and the underside is, of course, not as white it's just a lighter green than the top it doesn't have the, the the tiny leaf hairs on it so if you find a tree you want to know if it's a chinese or an american um, those are some of the features that you would look at um, of course there are hybrids that are um, out in the forest and in, in you know around everywhere that are like intermediate between these two it may have uh, some similarities to american some similarities to chinese um, but if you do find a, a chestnut in your yard or in the forest, those are things you want to look at to try and determine the species. And if you do find one you believe is an American, you know, we would ask that you send it to me, if you like, here um, at our research farms, and uh, we'll look at it and try and determine the, the species. So I wanted to come out in the woods and see if I can find some American chestnut stump sprouts. Middle there is about a three or four inch diameter sprout that was growing. It, it's dead and it's obviously been dead for at least a year. On the, the left we have a, a have one that's probably an inch or so, and on the right here we have one that's that's a little less than an inch. But we've got those stump sprouts growing. Again, this would be the location where an American chestnut was growing a hundred years ago or more. And it probably actually died 100 years ago from the chestnut blight. But that root system is still here in the ground. And it will continue to, to sprout. And these stump sprouts will grow. And they'll continue to grow until they get big enough. And they catch the chestnut blight. And then unfortunately they will likely die from the chestnut blight like the big one here in the middle did. Here's some more chestnut stump sprouts I found a little further off the road into the forest under full shade canopy. And we've got some chestnut sprouts. If we look around here, we've got a bigger, the bigger one there has already died. And there's a small one there next to it that looks like has taken the blight probably this year. It's killed it, but below there you see another branch uh, taking off. So we've got some American chestnut stump sprouts here in this area. And if we walk just about four feet away, we find another chestnut sprout. And another three feet or so, just below that, we have another one. So here in this one little area, I see three American chestnut stump sprouts growing. So hopefully we will continue to get sprouts that come up. And maybe one day, with some of our research, we can get some blight resistance back into our native forest and we'll have these American chestnut trees growing to be big trees again, like these northern red oak trees. So that one is definitely the largest caliper chestnut sprout I've seen walking around here in the woods today. And that tree is 12 to 15 feet tall. It's important to point out there are other organizations that are also doing research on the American chestnut. We have the American Chestnut Cooperators Foundation. We have the Virginia Department of Forestry doing some research on American chestnut and of course the American Chestnut Foundation which we looked at and visited with today. There's also a number of universities that are doing research on American chestnut as well. I want to thank you for joining me today for my 15 minutes in the forest. Tune in again in two weeks where Jennifer Gagnon will take us to visit a logging operation to look at water quality protection measures.